Hello everybody, um, my name is Potomi Janicek, as you can see, and today I will talk to you a little bit about uh, Pashto, a very interesting language that I uh, started to learn recently, and that I think is highly misrepresented at the conference, as many other Indo-Aryan Indo languages here. There are not many people who learn, the, learn them, even in the polyglot circles, even the polyglot gathering. Uh, except maybe for Hindi and some people who speak Farsi, there are not many people who study, uh, as, as I've seen so far, Kurdish, Baluchi, Pashto, or Bengali, as, as we saw at the Timothy's lecture, or other uh, indo aryan languages. Um, so first of all, where Pashto is spoken, uh, those are two simple maps, but as you, can, as you will see later on, on Every single map shows a little bit a different territory where Pashto is actually spoken. Uh, but it's mainly spoken in two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and it's one of the two official languages in Afghanistan, together with Dari, uh, which is closely related to Farsi. And it's spoken in Pakistan, especially in the province of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, where it is a regional language, but it's not uh, one of the official languages in Pakistan on the state level. Um, so it is closely uh, related to uh, other uh, Iranian languages like Persian, Dari, Tajiki, Baluchi. The most closest relatives are Ormuri, Balochi, and, and Dari or, or, or Farsi here. But anyway, Pashto is not mutually uh, intelligible with any of those languages on a normal level of conversation. Uh, but knowledge of any of those languages can give you a strong advantage while uh, if you want to start learning uh, learning Pashto in the future. Uh, what is the number of speakers? It varies a lot, the statistics vary a lot, but it's more or less 50 to 60 million native speakers who use Pashto on a daily basis in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. And um, it's around 26, 25, 26 million in Pakistan and the same number in, in Afghanistan. So it's more or less half-half divided by, by those two countries. And uh, as for Pashto, it's, um, I would say it's, it's a hard language to learn because of the lack of resources and, it, or more better said, um, the resources that state different things about the language. So first of all, the, dialecto, the dialects are described in, uh, in a different manner in different grammar books. Uh, the pronunciation, the, the grammatical rules are described in different ways, uh, as you'll see later. Uh, I am studying the Kandahari, Western dialect of Pashto, which is spoken in southern Afghanistan. And most of the things that I will tell you about Pashto are connected to that version of the language, but there are, of course, multiple other versions of the language. There are, uh, normally, you can distinguish, uh, there's another map, uh, and the light blue color shows you where Pashto is spoken in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So, um, but the, this one, I think this one is better. So uh, there are two main uh, ways of dividing uh, the dialects. Uh, one of them is that here the Western dialect is spoken, and it's called Kandahari. Then you have the central one, which is Kabuli, and the eastern one, uh, which they call Ningrahari or Peshawari. That's one of the possibilities. Another one that I encounter is that there is a northern dialect spoken in Kabul and Peshawar, more, it's, and it's called Peshawari, and it, uh, it goes uh, straight here up to Kabul. Then it's central dialect, on which the official standard, that I will tell you more uh, uh, about uh, in a second, is based. Uh, and it's uh, from uh, Gherzai, it's, it's a Gherzai central, central dialect spoken by the largest tribal confederation in Afghanistan. And then the southern dialects uh, spoken in Pakistan, uh, parts of Baluchistan and, and in the province of Kandahar. Uh, so what about the standard? Theoretically, there is a standardized Pashto version uh, based on the uh, Gherzai dialect uh, from, se from central Afghanistan. And it is promoted by, uh, by radio television uh, in Kabul and by Academy of Science of Afghanistan. And it incorporates a lot of southern vocabulary, mainly from the Kandahari dialect, because it enjoys a high social prestige in Afghanistan when you speak the Kandahari dialect from, from the city. 
uh, but it is a standard that is uh, that many people are trying to uh, to force on others. But still, there are many people who who write Pashto in a different way. But of course, we speak Pashto in a different way. But then there, there are still authors who use the same words written in different manners, even in the same article. So the standards are trying to 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 be promoted. But especially in writing, if if we encounter a Pashto who, who does write down his language. Uh, he may use it in a different way from another uh, educated pastor, and uh, and there's not not one encountered standard. So that's also a fact that we have to face if we want to learn the language. That we'll encounter different kinds of uh, spelling uh, in in, uh, in Af Afghanistan and then in Pakistan. It's totally different because many people do not uh, learn to to write Pashto because of Urdu being the principal language at school. Um, another thing uh, is. So let's let's go to the to the um, characteristics of the language. Um, first of all, oh, I had one more slide. Uh, I don't know where it is. Maybe maybe it's later. <laughs> um, no, let's let's go to the pronunciation first. So the Arabic alphabet is used to write down Pashto, uh, and it's a modified Arabic alphabet that includes a lot of um, letters that. You, that you know from, from Farsi, if you have studied Farsi, and there are also some letters that are uh, typical uh, for Pashto. So first of all, I divided it to uh, four parts. So the first one are the letters existing in Arabic and in Pashto, and in Pashto native words. So that's uh, starting from, from right, it's R, H, G, J, S, S, Y, L, Ta, or I would say it with A, Ta, Na, Ma, Ka, Za, Ra, Da, Wa. And then there are Arabic letters used in Pashto only in loan words, mainly from Arabic origin or that came, uh, came to, to Pashto from Arabic but through Farsi or through Urdu. Uh, and those are uh, the letters that, they, that we tend to pronounce uh, differently in Pashto than they are pronounced in Arabic. So that's Z, 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 S, S, T. So uh, more, or le more or less like in Farsi. And then we have F which is uh, not a native consonant for Pashto speakers. So de depending on the dialect, it can be either pronounced f as fa or as pa. Uh, then we have uh, o, uh, which is either pronounced qa in Pashto or ka. Uh, then uh, this is pronounced like ha, like in, like in Farsi, like that letter. And then uh, this pronounce, both of them are pronounced like a glottal stop in Pashto, but uh, in many dialects they're not pronounced at all. And they may, um, mm, and they may also affect the preceding vowel and prolong and make it longer, as we will see in the examples. And those are also ways to write down Hamza, so a glottal stop uh, in the Arabic loan words that exist in Farsi, in, in Pashto. Uh, those letters exist in both Farsi and Pashto, and they are not encountered in Arabic. So that's ch, cha, pa, ga, ja. But uh, the official way of writing ga in, 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 for, in, in Pashto, as you can see, is placing the small circle here. But in Farsi, it's normally two, um, two uh, lines here. But there are also some versions of writing Pashto, which include uh, putting two, uh, two lines there or uh, three dots at the top. Uh, so there are three versions of writing this letter. That should be the, uh, that's meant to be the official one, but not everybody respects that. And then uh, the Pashto letters uh, that are mostly uh, created for, uh, for the retroflex sound that are not present in uh, most of the Indo, um, in, in Iranian, langu Iranian languages. So that's uh, ta, da, na, ra, sha, ra, uh, but they, are uh, pronounced differently in different dialects, especially ra and ra. Uh, that's the Kandahari Western pronunciation, but in Kabul and in uh, Eastern provinces, they are normally pronounced like ha and ga. Uh, and in Wardak dialect, which is one of the most uh, different Pashto dialects and not comprehensive, not mutually intelligible for other uh, Pashtun speakers, uh, ex mm, even though it is one of the central dialects, they are pronounced hya hya. Uh, and the last two letters, this is za and za. But they, uh, they can also sound differently in different dialects. Sometimes it's cha and ja, uh, like the letters mentioned before, and sometimes zh is pronounced like z or like j uh, in j, uh, especially in uh, Eastern uh, dialect of Pakistan. 
Then we have the vowels. The Kandahari dialect has seven vowels. E, O, O, A, E, A, E, the schwa. And uh, some of them are written down, some of them not. The schwa is never written down except at the end of the word when it is represented by this letter. A is never written down except in the end of the word when it's written like this. So we have to know if it's a schwa or a, uh, or a, a. E, uh, for E, Pashto has this uh, special letter uh, which, is, uh, which looks like a regular E in the Arabic alphabet, but the two dots are placed from up to down. Uh, not, um, not, uh, not like in uh, E. Uh, uh, o, which is uh, in Central and, and Eastern dialect, it's pronounced like A, the same as that. Uh, that as that vowel is normally represented by an aleph. And then O and U are represented by, by a wow, or they are not written down. And E is represented by this letter. And at the end of the word, either this uh, variation or this variation with the dot is used. Uh, that the, the the left one is normally used if we want to distinguish the the vowel e at the end of a word uh, with the diphthong i, uh, which is written with this. Uh, that and that's the distinction between uh, the pres uh, the the singular and the plural sometimes. For example, a man is sarai, and man in plural is sari, uh, but it's written in the same way if we do not place the two dots in the plural. We'll see that example later. And then there are two uh, other special pastoral letters uh, for the diphthong e at the end of the at the end of the only at the end of the the word, and one of them is uh, is called uh, this one is called the heavy uh, feminine e, and this one is called the heavy masculine e, uh, because the first one designates the uh, the feminine nouns, some of the feminine nouns. And the second one is mainly used in masculine nouns and in masculine uh, declension, but it's also used at the end of uh, the second person plural uh, in present tense. Uh, and the, that letter uh, is used only in Farsi loanwords at, at the beginning of a word. For example, azad, meaning free, uh, to, uh, to, de to um, designate the uh, vowel a. Ah. So that's basically how you write down Pashto according to this standard more or less. So that's one of the most interesting characteristics of Pashto. The heavy stress of, uh, is never predictable, so you have to know which syllable is stressed, and there are no rules, uh, basically no rules to, uh, to know that, where the stress is located. And uh, the, script, the Arabic script doesn't mark the stress at all. And sometimes the stress uh, makes a difference in the meaning of a word or uh, the form, uh, or it changes the form of a verb. Uh, in one of the, my grammar books, I saw an explanation that there is one rule, actually, to determine the stress, but it doesn't apply to any loan words, being them from uh, Farsi, Arabic, Hindi, Urdu, English, they don't count, only the native Pashto words, uh, and not the verbs. So basically, pa pa native Pashto uh, adjectives and nouns, if they end with a consonant, they should be the stress should fall on the last syllable, and if they end with a uh, vowel, the stress should fall on the penultimate syllable. But then the author of the book said uh, the main, uh, the main uh, exception from that rule is the new name of the language, which is pronounced Pashto, so the last vowel is, uh, is under stress, and there are multiple other exceptions that are most of the words that actually, uh, most of the words actually don't, don't follow that rule. So uh, we have to learn where the stress is, not only where the vowels are, but also where the stress is. So, uh, and examples that the stress may determine the meaning are uh, tonga, it's a pear tree, and tonga is a cart. Uh, and then in, in verbs, kenost, uh, he sat, and kenost, he's sitting. So here the first syllable is accentuated, uh, a schwa actually, which is not written down, and here the last syllable is accentuated. If, uh, as under stress, if if you know the the script, you may ask why uh, do they why uh, do they pronounce that word kenost, and I didn't pronounce this sh here because it isn't pronounced. <laughs> well, nobody knows. 
Uh, those are a couple of examples of Pashto words, because Pashto is uh, really uh, a language of consonant clusters and, and funny words, uh, actually. Uh, so the first one is Jmanz, it's a comb, mla, friend, njole, girl. So you can see the, um, the letter that designates a feminine ending, njole, khpelwaki, uh, independence, loir, hi. Uror, brother. Do you see these similarities? Those are both in the European languages. Sparj, uh, it's six. In Kandahari, there is Sparj. In Kabuli, Spag. Tsoke, uh, a chair. Uh, and then kisses in the plural. It's either Shklawi uh, or Shklawi, Shklawi or Shklawi. Uh, and of course, there are many others. Um, and then one of my favorite words in Pashto, uh, especially for its spelling, is roro. It means slowly. <laughs> there, in Pashto, there are a lot of words. Uh, there are Farsi cognates or that were borrowed from Farsi and Arabic, or from uh, Arabic through Farsi. So we can have a look at a couple of cognates with Farsi. So sister in Pash, uh, that's the Pashto words, and on the left hand side we have the Farsi equivalents. So sisters Khor in Pashto and Khohar Farsi. In Pashto father Plor, Pedar, Mor, Modar, Uror, Barodar, uh, a hand is Los, in Farsi it's Dust. Uh, so there is a, a common change uh, of the of the consonant D to L in in, uh, in Pashto. A day is Urad in uh, Pashto, Ruz in uh, in Farsi. So Z changed to D, and then the the consonant switched their places more more or less. Young, uh, that's a Farsi borrowing. It's uh, Duan in Pashto and Javan in Farsi. So you can see that G changed uh, often to Z in, uh, in Pashto. And wow is pronounced like W, like in Arabic, not like V in Farsi. A lamp is also a Farsi loan word. It's Tzirog, uh, whereas in, in Farsi it's Tzirog. So Chi changed to Tz, G to Z. That's a common change. Table is Mez in Pashto, Mez in Farsi, uh, a wall. Uh, it's a funny thing, it's the wall in, uh, uh, in Pashto, uh, but it comes from uh, divar uh, in, in Farsi, not from uh, the wall uh, uh, English. All right. To see uh, is uh, Lidl, um, it comes from Didan, uh, from, from Farsi Didan, so once again you can see the D changing into L, the beginning of the word, and the uh, ending of, of, the, um, of the infinitive is L, uh, with a schwa in Pashto. Mm, and I see, and in, in, in the present tense, is uh, winem in, in uh, Pashto, whereas it's mibinam in uh, Farsi, uh, where the prefix mi is uh, needed for the present tense to occur. But in Pashto, just the ending um is added, which corresponds to the ending am in Farsi. Uh, those words come from Arabic, and they came mainly through Farsi. Pashto, so a book is Kitab in Arabic, Kitab in Farsi, Kitab in Kandahari dialect of Pashto. Uh, mudir, director, uh, a teacher in Arabic, Mu'allim in Farsi, Mu'alem, in, and in uh, Pashto it's either uh, Malem, Malim, Malem, Malim. You can see that the, uh, that the sh historically short vowel A is prolonged because of the because of the glottal stop that is omitted, and then you can pronounce it malem, and and the a ah changes to a ah in the Kanahari dialect. A court, mahkama uh, in Arabic, it's mokama in 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 the Kanahari dialect or makama, and it's also pronounced uh, in a long way. The vowel is pronounced in a long way because uh, h disappears, or it's pronounced in a short way, mahkama, and the ha may also be heard. It depends on the dialect. It's either mahkama or mohkama or makama, mokama. And then sig, from Arabic marid, we have mariz, like in Farsi. Uh, a pen, uh, it uh, can be pronounced qalam in, uh, in Pashto or kalam. Uh, because q uh, is a foreign sound for Pashto speakers and it's often uh, reproduced as k. So it's kalam or qalam and the same uh, with the word difference which may be pronounced in four different ways because it's either farq or farq or park or park. 
depending on the dialect uh, in which it is used. And another interesting uh, borrowings um, are the word for a shopkeeper, it's Dukandar, which is also used in Urdu and Hindi. And it's widely used in Pashto, so it comes from the Arabic word dukan, and then the uh, Pashto, uh, the per Persian suffix dar from the from the verb dashtan. It's a person who owns a shop, who has a shop, and uh, so that dukan dar. An interesting borrowing can, uh, is here. Uh, praise be to God. In Arabic, alhamdulillah, in uh, in, for, in Pashto, alhamdulillah, but it's written in a different way. That's the, that's the Pashto version, that's the Arabic version. What is the difference and why is it? Does anybody know that? In the, in the original Arabic version, there's no Aleph here in the word for God because it means praise be to God, so Lillah. So we don't need an Aleph, but as Pashto doesn't know about the Arabic grammar, it's borrowed the word uh, Allah, not change in a way as a word for God, and it kept it like this. So that's the official uh, uh, spelling in, in Pashto, but that's the only acceptable way in Arabic. Uh, and then the word that in Pashto means dignity, it comes from the Arabic word ta'zim. Uh, it's uh, either ta'zim or, or ta'zim, uh, with the glottal stop or without a glottal stop. And there are two ways to form a plural, either a Pashto native possibility, so uh, tazi, tazimuna or, ta, uh, or tazimot. And it depends, it's sometimes a designation of a social status that someone prefers to use the Arabic uh, plural to show off that they know the uh, Arabic plural as well and that it is particularly an Arabic uh, borrowing. Those are English uh, borrowings, and they normally tend to take, uh, if uh, in English there is a dental sound, it uh, changes into a retroflex sound in Pashto. So we have but uh, here, a but, lorry is lorai, a truck is truck, truck. Uh, that's one of my favorites, it's a uh, rocket launcher, uh, and then a toolbox. A toolbox is a uh, glove uh, compartment, place where you put a toolbox. And, and then there are words uh, that come from Hindi and Urdu, uh, which are kitara, a fence, and kurkre, uh, a window. Uh, and that's the declension. I guess Pashto has two cases, or three cases, or four cases, depending on the grammar that you're reading. At the, time being. Uh, I, prefer, uh, I prefer the designation, uh, the, the description of Pashto grammar showing two cases uh, and do not, uh, okay, if, if, we tend to say, if we say that there are four cases, then we have casus rectus, casus obliquus one, casus obliquus two, and a vocative. Uh, I prefer to stick to that version of grammar because vocative is not, not that widely used. It's on, it's, in the Kandahari dialect it's used only, uh, ah, it's one, it's uh, one suffix ah added to the names ended with, that end with a consonant and only to names and some titles. Uh, so, and, and it's uh, often not described as a separate case. So, in, and, and this designation, I would call them first case and the second case because we'll see, um, we cannot uh, tell that they are either nominative, accusative, or absolutive, ergative. It's, it's hard to describe actually how, the, how those case, uh, cases function. Uh, so those are the names that we can adopt theoretically, but then uh, we'll see how they, uh, how they are used. Um, so uh, this is the masculine declension, the four um, most common patterns, but there are a lot of different patterns and, and uh, exceptions, of course. So one of the words is the word for book, which is kitab, in plural it's kitabuna, and casus obliquus it's kitab in singular and kitabuno in the plural. That's one of the uh, most important and most regular markers in the Pashto language, that the plural in casus obliquus is marked by o at the end. And that is um, actually regular in 90 something percent of the cases, except for the words that are not declined uh, 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 at, uh, at all. Yeah? Sorry, this word is the oblique case. Uh, the oblique case, uh, it's one of the. Des uh, it's, uh, I will tell that later. Okay. Uh, because uh, you will see in the, in, the, in the practice a bit, but then I will des describe it in uh, more detail. Uh, another word is a word for uh, for student. It's shogirt. Shogirt. 
Uh, in plural, it takes uh, the ending on, so it's shagirdan. In cases of liquid, it's shagird and shagirdanu. And then a uh, word for a man, it's sarai. As you can see, it's written the same way, but it's pronounced sari in the plural. Sari in casus oblicus and sario in plural. And then mama, it's a maternal uncle, not a mother. Uh, mama, mama gone in plural. Mama in casus oblicus singular and in casus oblicus plural, mama gone. Uh, that's the masculine declension and the feminine, uh, and the feminine declension looks like this. Those are once again four uh, most important uh, ways uh, most, more, more important classes of nouns. Um, there's only masculine and, and feminine in, at least in the dialect that I'm learning. Um, so that's the word for a woman. It's Khidza. Khidza or Khidza in Kabul. Khidza uh, in plural Khidzi. Khidze, I'm sorry. Khidze. Khidze and Khidzo. So once again, we can see the ending O. Then um, words ending with a consonant that drop the uh, last vowel, that's uradz, a day, uradze, uradze, and uradzo. Uh, then spy, uh, which means a female dog, a bitch. Uh, spy, spy is a male dog, and spy is a, a female dog. Uh, so it's spy, 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 spyo. Uh, and then the fatherland of the Pashtuns, Pashtunhua, or Pashtunhua in the Eastern dialects, and it's in uh, plural in casus obliquus. So the, the easiest one is this ending, and in singular casus obliquus it barely changes. But you have to always remember to which class the noun, uh, the noun uh, is, which pattern the noun is obliged to follow, and for that uh, we barely have rules in Pashto. So, let's see some sentences. And that explains the basic sentence and the ergativity uh, of the Pashto language. Um, Pashto has split ergativity. Uh, like, uh, if, you, if you saw uh, Bren Lu's lecture on, on word Piri, in word Piri, there's also a split ergativity in the past tense, if I remember correctly. So, the same, uh, the same is correct for Pashto. The, it is a nom more or less a nominative accusative language in the present tense, but in four of, of its past tenses, in present perfect, past perfect, uh, past imperfect, and past progressive, yes. Uh, it is uh, it is ergative absolutive. So uh, let me explain how it works. So uh, that sentence means a man. There's one apple and one man, and the verb is going to be to eat. So the man eats. Uh, it's the apple. It's sarai mana hori. Uh, sarai is a man. Mana is an apple, or the apple. Hori means eats, and the third person uh, singular. Uh, so, the, the verb uh, acts according to the subject, which is sarai. Which is sarai. Uh, so, it looks like in English uh, or French or Spanish or most of the European languages except for Basque. Uh, and the word mana, as you can see, is in the casus rectus. So, it doesn't take the casus obliquus, doesn't take the second case. So, it's not accusative, we can say. It's still in the first case. Both of the words are in the first case. When does the second case uh, come in? It comes in, this, in the, in the uh, past tenses. So when you have a m the man ate the apple, you have sarai, mana, sarai, mana, the same, and then huarela in the past tense. Uh, sa sari, I'm sorry, sari, mana, huarela. So sari means the man, but in the second case. So we have to change the case in which the subject, as what we think of as a subject, uh, is expressed. And then, uh, and then uh, make an accordance between the verb and the actual object of the sentence. Because huarela means eight, uh, but it's feminine. It's third person feminine. So it is like the word mana, apple, which is feminine. So it, it is the ergativity that exists in Pashto. So this, this uh, verb is not, uh, is not in masculine, as the word for man should uh, suppose, like in, in European languages, but it's 
uh, it acts uh, according to the object, which is feminine. Sari, mana, huarela. And the subject changes to the second case. And uh, next thing is, we, when we have many men and one apple. So the men, in plural, uh, eat an apple. Sari, are the men in plural, first case. Mana, singular first case. Hori, which is the same as third person singular. The third person plural of the verb is the same. So we have to, we have to look closely on the, on the declension and on the conjugation not to understand every single sentence, how they, how they are different. It looks the same, right? Sarai manachori, but this sari manachori, and it's many men, not one man. We have to know how to pronounce the words to understand, uh, to understand it, uh, maybe from the context when it's written. Uh, and in, in the past tense, it's going to be sario manachuarela. So the man, uh, the man ate the apple, and the man are in the second case plural. So the ending o that we observed before, sario mana is still in the first case singular, an apple, and the verb. Uh, acts according to the object. So it's in past tense, third person feminine, huarela, eight. And those are the uh, examples for uh, the, the other situations when we have many apples and one man. It's going to be sarai, mane, hori. So mane is in plural, apples, but it's still in the first case. First case, first case, first case of casus rectus. Sari, sarai, mane, hori. In the past tense, it's sari uh, mane huarele because the subject has to change because of the split ergativity, and uh, it works like this. But what happens? Maybe I will tell that if we have. Do we have a bit of time? Three minutes. Okay. Uh, so I will tell you how it works when we don't have the object, because that's uh, that's funny, and I didn't include it in the presentation because I thought we wouldn't have time. Uh, for example, if I have that here, an interesting situation. Uh, okay, I eat an apple. Uh, are you going to see that? Actually, I'm not sure. I will try to do it. I eat an apple would be manachorem or z manachorem. Z means I. And I ate an apple. We have to change the person I to the second case. So it's zma, mana, huarela, and huarela acts according to this feminine uh, object, which is an apple. But uh, so that's the explanation with the person. And what if we don't have the object? If we don't have the object and we want to say uh, a sentence like I win and I won, uh, we have um, Can you see that? No. Okay, so let's try it here. Gatum. Gatum ye. It means I win. And this, this word is substituting the object. So it's, uh, we can translate it to English as I win it. Let's say we have to, we have to put it normally in, in, in formal particles. Gatum ye. But if we want to say I won, we have to change, uh, we have to change the first person. But it normally doesn't follow the pattern zizma because it's put after the verb and then it has a second form. And it's gatum. Uh, no, it's not gatum. It's gatulum, if I remember correctly. It's gatula. It's gatula. And it's gatula me. That means I won. So, basically, when we have the present tense, we conjugate the verb normally. It's me. I am winning. So gatum. But we have to say it. I win it. But in the in the past tense. It looks like it, it is uh, it uh, it um, works like an ergative language, so we always put the the verb in the third person feminine, <laughs> always when there's no object. So it's gatula, like we saw in huarela, we have gatula. So the the third person feminine in past tense and me, which is the second case for 
me. The second option, because zmo is one of the options when we put it before the verb, but when we put it after the verb, it's me. So gatila me means I won, but literally it means she won me. <laughs> and that's how Pashto works. Uh, if you uh, would like to learn Pashto in the future, uh, there are uh, a couple of resources on the internet. There are two, uh, two, pay, two uh, internet sites that I encountered, one with uh, resources in English and one with resources in Russian. Uh, and it has a lot of links or, or names of the books and the authors uh, that, that wrote about Pashto, that made manuals to learn Pashto. And there is also one Pashto grammar, the, I think it's the most recent Pashto grammar published in English, written by Nor, Nor Ola, and this is not present in the, uh, in the link uh, at the site uh, that, uh, that I put here. And uh, I highly recommend you to look at, if you want to learn Pashto, to look at as many resources as you can and to compare them, because there are so many different versions of describing the language uh, that in any single grammar book you may encounter different descriptions, different versions of the language, different pronunciations, different grammatical descriptions, and then, well, you have to confront it with the, with the reality then, with how the people speak, and that's a lot of diversity in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Pashtun regions. And that's everything for now. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, so we start with the questions. If you have any question, you can still still post them on, on Slido with the password polyglot, and we are in the ASIML room. I already have a couple of questions here for you, so mm -hmm. sure. I'll start with the most popular one. How different is Pashto from Dari and from Persian? It is different enough not to understand Pashto if you speak, uh, speak Farsi, if you speak Persian. Uh, I have never learned Dari, but I'm learning uh, I've been learning Persian since two years, and it's, it doesn't help me in understanding Pashto, like literally. It does help me with understanding certain words, uh, or to learn some words faster, because they're related, but in understanding the language, how it is spoken when I'm listening to some Pashto, Pashto radio, uh, it doesn't help me in ju just to recognize some words, but not to understand the context. So... I don't know how about Baluchi. We would have to ask a person who speaks Baluchi or, or Muri and wants to learn Pashto. I, th I, I think they're not much mutually intelligible, but to compare those two approaches, when you already speak uh, Farsi and when you already speak Baluchi or, or Muri, maybe that would be easier when you want to learn. Uh, Pashto has conserved a lot of uh, a lot of features that that Farsi either doesn't have or has lost in the in the past, uh, like like declension, like ergot uh, like ergativity, uh, and a lot of different structures. So um, basically, it helps a bit with the with the endings, for example, in the in the conjugation or with some verb, uh, some sentence structures, because it's uh, subject, object, verb, like in, like in Farsi. Uh, but then uh, it's only the theory. And in, in the practice, you can, you can <laughs> encounter different, uh, different word order in Pashto and different dialects. So it helps, but not, it's, I think, I still think it's the, it's very good when you speak Farsi and you want to learn Pashto, but it won't make the path easy for you. Um, are Pashto speaking regions bilingual? Is it the dominant language in those regions? Uh, so in Afghanistan, um, it is the dominant language in those areas. Uh, but the fact is that although uh, both Pashto and Dari are official languages in Afghanistan, most of the Pashto speakers do speak Dari very well, if they went to school, of course. Uh, but most of the Dari speakers do not speak Pashto in a, uh, in, uh, on, on, a, on a level that would enable them the, a normal conversation in Pashto. So when a Pashto and a Dari native speaker meet, they would normally speak, uh, speak Dari with each other, which, uh, which makes a Pashto a language that is learned by other people, for example, but is uh, generally spoken only between the people who are native speakers of the language. And on most of those territories around, around Kabul and around Kandahar, Pashto 
is uh, uh, is the main language. But Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, there are so many ethnicities and so many languages that they that, that they are just just uh, just by each other. And in and also in the regions where, in Pakistan, there are some minority languages that are also spoken there. Uh, <coughs> And there are also communities who speak different languages, that are, uh, different Pakistani languages like Baluchi or uh, Urdu, maybe less frequently, less frequently in that regions. But there are mainly Pashtun regions, but there's also other communities. Is there a standard form of Pashto used in media and education? There is a standard form used by certain media stations and in education, I would say, and that is uh, correct only for Afghanistan. In Pakistan, there are different standards. What is, your, sorry, what is your background with Arabic and the Iranian languages? How and where did you learn them? What is my, one scan your, please? Your background with my Arabic background. and the Iranian, Iranian languages. I'm, uh, I'm studying Middle Eastern languages uh, at my university, so it's uh, my second year studying Arabic and, and, and Farsi at the university, and I started learning Pashto at a course in my university because it finally opened up. When were the Pashto specific letters invented? Actually, I don't know, but I think it should be in the 19th century, but I don't know. First, uh, first written Pashto dates back to 16th century, but in 19th century at the beginning and of the 20th century, it, it evolved a lot. So uh, I would guess 19th century, maybe the beginning of 20th century, but I'm not sure. It's, maybe it's even 16th century. And then there is a, a, a well question request if you can show the links for learning Pashto on the screen sure. again. Do we have some other questions? Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you, but you will not be heard in the on the camera. Maybe you said something I didn't hear. Um, when the you want your the recording? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, when there's a difference between change in the subject in the past tense between transitive and intransitive, so an intransitive verb, you wouldn't have the change. I mean, if it's like, for example, like Napoli, if it acts like that. Is that the case? So if you have, if you have a transitive verb, then you're going to have to change the subject, right? There's going to be... In both transitive and intransitive verbs, you have to change the subject. To Even the intransitive, case. like I went. Even in intransitive, you have to change the subject. Yes, exactly. But, but in, only the in the past tense? Only in the, past, in the four past tenses that exist in Pashto. You always have to change the subject, even if, uh, if it's transitive or intransitive. If it is transitive, then the verb uh, acts according to the object. And if it's not transitive, the verb uh, is always in the third person plural, uh, in the third person singular feminine. So it's basically coming from a passive point, er ergative type. It's, it was, it's passive, basically. It happens to me. Yes, exactly. It's just in passive. So in, in some constructions. So in the present in, in tense, you don't have it? Uh, no, except for some verbs. But what about the case in the present tense if the direct object is uh, animate? Uh, I don't think so. No, I'm I, just I, checking to see if it acts like Nepali or like Tibetan. If it's or an animal. Some, yeah. Um, I haven't no, heard no, about that. Animate, like a person, an, yeah. An enemy? Am I saying it wrong? <laughs> An animate. Animate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm no, I have trouble with English. I work on it hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, if it's an inanimate object, I think there is no example, no change. I see yeah. The, yeah. The bedroom, I see the book. The, the verb will not change. It will not be it will not be an ergative construction. No. No, the, it, it will not be an ergative construction. Are there any more questions coming? No? Okay. Thank you very much.